In my last video titled The Mind of Aaron Yeager, we analyzed Aaron's character and tried to give him the label of hero or villain. In summary, I concluded that it was difficult to attach one of these archetypes to Aaron as his life story was too complex to give him a label so cut and dry. But in this video, I wanted to add to my prior analysis of Aaron and discuss his more villainous tendencies. It is very apparent that Aaron's actions in season 4 were questionable, but what I wanted to tackle in this video is to analyze Aaron's philosophies as to why he committed those actions. But before we delve into Aaron's moral philosophy, I believe it is important to understand the legacy he inherited from his predecessors. See, without Aaron knowing, he has been tied to a predicament where he is a key player, and the mantle that gives him such prowess is the mantle of the Attack Titan. See, the mantle of the Attack Titan is much more different than any ordinary mantle being passed down. The carriers of this mantle all share common behaviors, goals, and most importantly, can share their experiences through delving into each other's memories even after a carrier has died or before they are born. Coincidentally, all who inherit the attack titan are rebellious in nature, have an affinity for strength, are stoic, and have experienced tragedies that catalyze their radicalization. These characteristics are also sought after when a user is looking for a successor. For instance, the first user of the Attack Titan that we know of in the anime is Eren Kruger, and his life story follows the aforementioned traits exactly. Kruger showcases his rebelliousness as he re-establishes the Eldian Restorationist movement. Also, he becomes a double spy in the Marlian ranks who aids the Restorationists from the moniker the Owl. On his mission, Kruger is stoic and performs atrocities against his own Eldian kind, but does so for his eventual end goal of freeing them. Lastly, like his predecessors, Kruger underwent a traumatizing event that led him down this path, which was his witnessing of Marlin officers burning his family alive. As a result of this trauma, Kruger vowed to exact his revenge on Marley. Following, Kruger's successor Grisha Jaeger has a story that is parallel to him. Just like Kruger, Grisha underwent a similar trauma when he discovered that his sister Faye was tragically mauled by dogs by the Marlian officers. As a result, Grisha wished for freedom for his fellow Eldians and joined the Eldian Restorationists. Also, like Kruger, Grisha commits unethical actions for his mission, such as being negligent to his firstborn son Zeke Jaeger and burdening him with unattainable expectations. This negligence of Grisha would then lead to the downfall of the Restorationists, and because of his carelessness, many of his companions that followed him were turned into mindless titans. But although Grisha failed, he was saved by Eren Kruger, and as a result of Grisha having similar characteristics to him, Kruger passes on his titan powers onto Grisha to continue their mission to free Eldia. Now this brings us to Eren Jaeger, who has all the characteristics of his predecessors. From a young age, Aaron is rebellious, desires freedom, and is shown to be emotionless at the sight of cruelty. And just like his predecessors, he was traumatized by a tragic event that led to his radicalization, which was his mother being eaten by a titan. Now, at the beginning of the series, Aaron does not have these cold characteristics, and overall, he is still naive. It is not until he comes to face with consequential challenges and betrayals is when he adopts all those characteristics wholeheartedly. It is only after surviving all those challenges and paradigm shifts is when Aaron begins to adopt a more stoic composure akin to his predecessor Aaron Kruger. This influence on Aaron is so potent that he even goes as far as to adopt that lie as Kruger when he disguises himself in Marley. Now the reason as to why I bring this up is because this transformation of Aaron showcases that the mantle of Attack Titan is not only a mantle that inherits powers, but a mantle that inherits a philosophy. A philosophy to desire freedom and to keep moving forward no matter what. And the reason as to why I am emphasizing the characteristics of this fictional philosophy of the Attack Titan is because it bears numerous similarities to the real life philosophy of Machiavellianism. Now this philosophy, Machiavellianism, was introduced by the 16th century Florentine philosopher Niccolo Machiavelli, who wrote the book The Prince. Now this book was very controversial 
as it was written to instruct princes how to rule and encourage them to be cunning, manipulative, and to prioritize the interests of the state over conventional morals, such as at that time, Christian values. One of the key takeaways from the prince posits the idea of if a ruler can be a good person and an effective ruler. Well, according to Machiavelli, the answer is an effective ruler cannot be completely good. And this notion is why the prince is so controversial. According to Machiavelli, when it comes to the position of being a political leader, the moral conduct that we as a society often conform to has no place in the political sphere. He further states that it is a leader's duty to prioritize effectiveness over being a good person. Now the concept that Machiavelli uses to measure a ruler's effectiveness is the concept of fortune and virtue. This concept deems that leaders must not rely on luck but shape their own fortune through charisma, cunningness, and force. In addition to those components, a leader must be brave, powerful, and impose their own will onto others. If I were to surmise Machiavelli's views into one of his quotes, I'd use the quote where he states that, it is much safer to be feared than loved, because love is preserved by the link of obligation, which, owing to the baseness of men, is broken at every opportunity for their advantage. But fear preserves you by a dread of punishment which never fails. Therefore, according to Machiavelli, it is ideal for a leader to be both feared and loved, but this situation is not pragmatic in all circumstances. Subsequently, a leader has to choose to be feared rather than loved in order to maintain order in the state and to oblige any potential detractor or enemies to be obedient. So with the philosophy of the attack titan and the philosophy of Machiavellianism bearing many similarities, we can conclude that the reason for Aaron's adopted callous nature is due to the fact that he deems it necessary for the survival and future preservation of Eldians. In season 1, when Aaron is more naive, when he faces Annie Leonhardt, he is sorrowful and tries to understand the reason behind Annie's betrayal. But this sorrowful nature lends Aaron to fail over and over again. This is evident when we see Aaron's pathetic nature shown when he cries in front of Historia in the underground chapel and when he cries in front of Mikasa when he could not save Hans from being eaten by Dina Fitch's titan, the same titan that ate his mother. In both these situations, Aaron found himself to be powerless and ineffective. He found himself repeatedly in a vicious cycle of mortifying defeats. Hence, in order for Aaron to get out of this cycle, he drew inspiration from his predecessor Aaron Kruger in that he must prioritize effectiveness at all costs and realized that the cruel world he lives in does not favor the meek but those who are strong and can impose their will over their enemies. So at the end of season 3, we see that Aaron's stoic composure as a signifier to show us that he accepts the cruelty of his world and that in order for him to protect his friends and race, he must prioritize effectiveness over morality. Now that we have understood the rationale behind Aaron's philosophy through Machiavellianism, I think a good way to understand his actions is through Robert Greene's book, The 48 Laws of Power. Now Robert Greene is an author often referred to as the modern day Machiavelli, as his book has influence from the prince and touches upon similar subject matter. In this book, Greene informs his readers of the evil side of human nature and instructs the reader on how to utilize power dynamics to contest against said evil. Now, the three major actions of Aaron that I'll be discussing in this analysis are his attack on Marley, his forming of the Jaegerists, and finally, his activation of the Rebelling. Firstly, Aaron's attack on Marley correlates with Green's 42nd law which instructs to strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. And the shepherd in the scenario is Willie Tibber. As we can see, Willie is the ultimate Machiavellian. He is charming, magnetic, cunning, and his ability to have the world unite into one front against Perry D with just mere words is a true testament to how threatening he truly is. With Willie's demonstration on stage, we see how glued people are to the stage. They cheer, and some even are brought 
to tears. In his book, Green writes, Do not waste your time lashing out in all directions at what seems to be a many-headed enemy. Find the one head that matters, the person with willpower, or smarts, or most important of all, charisma. Cancer begins with a single cell. Excise it before it spreads beyond cure. Therefore, what we can presume through Green's words is that Willie is that single cancer cell that spreads and must be excised. Hence, for Aaron's plan to succeed, it was essential for him to kill Willie Tibber as soon as possible, for he is the orchestrator behind the morale of thousands. And as we can see soon after Aaron devours Willie, all of the sheep scatter in panic. Secondly is Aaron's formation of the Jaegeris. Now Green's law that correlates with this action of Aaron's is Law 43 which instructs to work on the hearts and minds of others. In his book, Green writes, In the game of power, you are surrounded by people who have absolutely no reason to help you unless it is in their interest to do so. The key to persuasion is softening people up and breaking them down gently. Seduce them with a two-pronged approach. Work on their emotion and play on their emotions and play with their intellectual weaknesses. Self-interest is the strongest motive of all. What this law suggests is that the best way to gain support from people is to demonstrate to them how your action will benefit them. Now for the Jaegerist, there are two prominent individuals that we can analyze to understand how Aaron's movement influenced others to join his cause. And these individuals are Flock and Luis. With Flock's backstory, we can comprehend that he has a desire to be a strong hero akin to his former commander, Erwin Smith. Similarly, Luis joins the Scott Regiment to gain power as well to save people. Hence, with both Flock and Luis's desires to acquire power to save their people, Aaron's Jaegerist movement serves as an opportunity that appeals to them. Furthermore, this same notion applies to Yelena. With Yelena, we see she had two motives. The first is to be solidified in history by assisting in Z. Jaeger's mission, and the second is to bring about the fall of the Marlian Empire. Hence, with the common enemy forged between Eren and Yelena, they team up to have their desires fulfilled. Another integral individual similar to Yelena is Kiyomi Azumabito, the ambassador to Izuru. Now when it comes to Kiyomi, she has two desires. The first is the acquisition of wealth, and the second is the pride of her nation. The reason as to why Eren and Peri D are appealing to Kiyomi is due to Peri D's reserves of ice burst stones. In addition, Kiyomi also desires to reconnect with Mikasa as she is a descendant of a shogun from Hizuru related to the Azumabito clan. And lastly, we have Zeke Jaeger. With Zeke Jaeger, we surmise that his goal is to save the world from the titans and simultaneously end the suffering of Eldians by sterilizing all subjects of Ymir. Now, with his goal in mind, he needed to gain the founding titan powers to activate the rumbling on a small enough scale to defeat Marley and to also sterilize all subjects of Ymir. Therefore, as a result of Eren being Zeke's half-brother and possessing the powers of the founding titan, Zeke is inclined to team up with Eren. Hence, with the aforementioned individuals, we can see how Eren appeals to their desires in order for them to join his cause. Even though Eren did not agree with the morals of those he allied himself with, in order to be an effective leader, he had to perform this necessary evil. However, we can see that Eren did not ally himself with Yelena, Kiyomi, and Zeke wholeheartedly. In episode 78 to 80, we see Eren exposed to Zeke his ulterior motive to not go through with the euthanasia plan, and instead to perform the rumbling on a large scale. Now this betrayal coincides with Green's 21st law which instructs to play a sucker to catch a sucker seem dumber than your mark. Therefore with law 43 and 21, we can understand that Aaron only allied himself with those who contradicted his morals to get what he wanted and once his deceit proved to be successful is when he performed his ultimate move. 
Now this leads us to Aaron's activation of the rumbling, which correlates with Green's 15th law, which instructs to crush your enemy totally. Through this law, Green states that a feared enemy must be crushed completely. If one ember is left alight, a fire will eventually break. The enemy will recover and will seek revenge. Crush him not only in body, but in spirit. Now this instruction of Green's correlates with one of Aaron's quotes when he arrives at the beach at the edge of Paradis and says, those enemies on the other side of the sea. If we kill them all, does that mean we'll be free? Both of these quotations by Green and Aaron bring about the same meaning. They both realize that their enemies are never ending. In Aaron's case, it is not enough for him to just defeat Marley, because there will always be other nations that fear Eldians. And as long as that hatred for Eldians is there, Eldians will never be safe. Even if Marley is gone, there will be another nation to take its place. Hence, in order to alleviate his people from this quandary, Aaron deems that the best decision to make for the freedom of Eldians is to enact the rumbling. Now, the final Machiavellian concept I want to delve into to wrap this video up is the moral philosophy of the master-slave morality by our channel's favorite philosopher, Friedrich Nietzsche. Now, this philosophy proposes that individuals who fall under the master morality value pride and power. Nietzsche calls this morality the morality of the strong-willed, those who actualize their goals through their willpower. On the contrary, individuals who are categorized in the slave morality value kindness, empathy, and sympathy. These individuals are more charitable. Now, the reason as to why I bring this concept up is because it relates to the relationship between Aaron Yeager and one of his predecessors, and that predecessor being Ymir, the founding titan. Now, Aaron can be categorized as having a master morality due to his Machiavellian actions, and Ymir can be categorized as having a slave morality as she literally is a slave. But what's interesting is that even when Ymir gains her titan powers, she is still a slave to the Marlian king and puts the needs of her nation before hers. Consequently, even after her death, she is destined to still serve her descendants for eternity. Now, according to Machiavelli, Ymir is someone we should not become like. In The Prince, Machiavelli talks about a ruler by the name of Girolamo Savonarola. Savonarola was a Dominican friar and fervent Christian who became the ruler of Florence in 1494. He preached against corruption and emphasized good Christian morals. However, Savonarola's reign did not last long after he became an enemy to Pope Alexander VI. And as a result, Savonarola was imprisoned and tortured to death. Now, according to Machiavelli, the reason for Savonarola's tragedy was due to his values as a leader being weak. And the story resembles Ymir's. Therefore, as a leader, there are two philosophies to take. Either you become a ruler who is strategic, strong, and ruthless, or be one who is a humanitarian. In an ideal world, it'd be nice to be a leader who withholds strong morals. However, as we can see with the past examples, it is evident that the world is not ideal. Being a kind ruler is good until you inevitably come across enemies as ruthless as King Carl Fritz, the parody royal family, Theo Magath, and Willie Tibur. Therefore, it suffice to say, through analyzing Nicola Machiavelli, Robert Greene, and Friedrich Nietzsche's works, as a leader, you must choose effectiveness over morality, or else the world will devour you. Hence, we can gather that although Aaron's actions are villainous, they were necessary to preserve what he values most, which is the freedoms of his friends and nation.